Okay, so we'll, um, uh, yeah, happy Friday. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I am uh, on campus. I'm in my office right now, so that's why the uh, the background is different. You don't see the uh, the kitchen <laughs> in the background here, but um, uh, yeah, it's actually um, it's it was nice to just walk around, uh, even though the campus is mostly. I mean, there are like people walking around, but definitely not as lively as normal. So, uh, okay, let's take a look. Uh, week two, Friday. Um, we're going to talk about regularization today, all right? And so, um, it, you know, all of this, I'm still using it in the context of kind of least squares regression, just because that's something you're familiar with. And so, when I introduce some kind of new idea and new concept here, hopefully you can just kind of focus on the new part. And not get distracted by all of the, you know, everything else about the model, and so because you already understand the uh, least squares um, regression stuff, right? Okay, and so you know, all of this, all of this stuff is just kind of like strategies to avoid overfitting. Okay, and so um, you know, overfitting is so you know when you do machine learning. Overfitting is a very common problem just because you have a lot of times you, you have this massive amount of data coming in and you want to, you know, you're hoping to find some kind of uh, information there uh, that will generalize to something else. But just because the amount of information that you have available to train from is so big, um, it, it's very possible to um, start fitting, you know, weird specifics uh, of that particular data set that, that just don't generalize, right? And so one strategy is cross-validation, right? And, um, and that kind of splits it into your training and your validation sets. And, you know, you, you train your parameters based on the training data, okay? And so obviously your model is going to fit the training data fairly well, but then you test it against your validation set. And if it also does a good job predicting your validation set, then, then we feel like, oh, okay, we've, we've done a good job. But if it does a poor job of fitting the validation set, then, then you know, you know I probably overfit the training data, okay? Uh, regularization is another strategy. Um, and basically it's, it's what we call a shrinkage method, okay? And it, it intentionally kind of shrinks the, uh, the parameters that we use to fit. And, uh, and it can be used again also to avoid overfitting. Um, it also kind of plays a role in this whole bias variance trade-off thing. And, you know, we can talk about that later as well. Um, but the, uh, the main idea here for regularization is that we are going to modify the loss function uh, by kind of um, putting in some kind of penalty for models that are more complex than simpler models. Okay. And so, you know, so far for ordinary least squares regression, we've started off here by kind of just saying, you know, we want the mean square to error or maybe the total square to error. And so currently our loss function is L, okay? Our loss function is L for ordinary least squares of regression. We find it by taking the difference between the actual or the target values and what we predicted by uh, least squares regression, which is the product of the X matrix and our coefficients inside the W vector, right? So our predicted values are X times W, the actual values are T, and then we kind of get the squared, the sum of the squared values by doing t minus x w transpose t minus x w, right? And, and if we use this and we say, all right, let's minimize this loss function, then the best model will, will end up being our ordinary least squares coefficients, okay? And, um, but if we say, you know, our goal, whatever our goal is, is just to minimize the mean squared error as much as possible, then, um, then we're going to always kind of pick a more complicated model because we know that as you add more terms and mo more um, make your model more and more complicated, you might be able to shrink the, uh, the, pre um, the amount of error. You know, you can always kind of increase your R squared value uh, a little bit uh, every single time with, whenever you add a variable. And so you can end up getting some kind of complicated model, right? And so that's why in linear regression, they they have all kinds of strategies for you know how to avoid you know doing that exact thing okay 
Um, with regularization, we're not going to say, you know what, <laughs> um, uh, uh, we're not going to rely on some kind of outside ideas about, you know, you know, minimize this, but not really, okay? Because that's kind of what we're doing in linear regression. We say, you know, we want to minimize our mean square to error, but not too much, okay? Here, we're going to just say, we want to minimize our loss function, and that's it, okay? But what we do is, into our loss function, we build in a penalty for complexity, okay? So we're going to say, um, we're going to add in a kind of a, a complexity term, all right, which is basically going to say, you know, the more um, complex this becomes, our model becomes, this value is going to get bigger, okay? And so now we have a balancing act, okay? Here we have the OLS, just the, your uh, mean squared error here, or your uh, total squared residuals. That's part of your loss function. So we want to shrink this, but also there's a complexity element, okay? And if your model gets too complicated, this thing's going to get bigger, and over, your overall uh, L prime is going to get bigger. Okay, so we call L prime the regularized loss, and it's the combination of the ordinary least squares regression loss plus some comp, uh, complexity penalty. And you have some term lambda, which is going to kind of uh, weigh how much the complexity matters versus the OLS, okay? So you kind of shift lambda around and you kind of have this you know, bit of a balancing act here, all right? And so this is a silly analogy um, that, that I have in real life is that, you know, maybe um, you have different kind of priorities to, to weigh out in making a decision, right? And so, you know, let's say, um, you know, you, you get a job and you're gonna, look for an apartment to live in and you're trying to make a decision between a couple apartments okay and so one apartment costs two thousand dollars a month in rent uh, and the commute to work is 10 minutes each way and then the other apartment costs less 1700 a month but the commute is 40 minutes each way all right and so the question is which which apartment do you pick right so if money is the only thing that matters to you Okay, then the decision is easy. You just pick the, the cheapest apartment possible, right? If money is the only thing that matters, right? But most people value their time and, um, and there's a trade-off, right? The cheaper apartment comes with a longer uh, commute, okay? And so, so how, do you, how do you balance this, right? And so basically, you're going to have, each person is going to have a different preference factor, okay? Do you prefer... Um, having a shorter commute and having more time at the end of the day, or do you prefer saving money, right? And everybody has, has to uh, make a different decision for themselves, right? So if you, if you value your time greatly, so maybe you have an active social life outside of work, or you just like uh, not having a commute, maybe you really hate um, driving and traffic and all of that, then, you know, the, the, the weight that we assign to kind of this penalty of the longer commute, we're going to give more weight to that and we're more likely to choose the apartment that's closer to work despite it costing more because uh, to that person, the penalty of commuting, commuting outweighs the savings on the rent, okay? On the other hand, if someone um, doesn't mind this time spent commuting, you know, for example, I actually enjoy listening to podcasts and audiobooks, sitting in the car and stuff like that. And if that's something that you don't mind, then you might choose the one um, with the larger commute um, and uh, lower rent, okay? And so the true cost of the apartment is the rent plus some kind of preference factor, which, you know, just some arbitrary number that you is going to differ from person to person um, multiplied by kind of the commute penalty. All right, and, and it all comes down to kind of how, how do you convert, you know, the 40 minutes to each way or 10 minutes each way into kind of a dollar value and, and something like that. But that's just, that's gonna kind of be how you, um, you weigh your decisions, okay? Um, so, you know, we're gonna kind of take that idea and apply it to um, linear regression here. And uh, it's important to keep in mind that we are still trying to minimize or optimize a loss function, okay? And so, you know, one thing we're not doing 
you know, uh, so unlike the, the apartment example is not a perfect analogy because you're not just comparing one model to another, right? Here we're kind of, um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, optimize the loss function and, we're, and we've modified it. And so we're trying to kind of find the actual coefficients that is going to result in the, uh, the lowest uh, possible, um, you know, um, loss function, okay? So it's, it's, so this is kind of like, um, if somebody says, this is my um, commuting preference and, um, and whatnot, it's kind of, it's more like, can we imagine the best possible apartment, right? The best possible apartment is gonna be the apartment that costs this much and has this kind of commute or something like that, all right? That we're, we're trying to imagine the model or figure out the model that's going to work best with the, uh, the terms that we've given, the, uh, the, the loss function, the ordinary least squares loss function plus the uh, complexity uh, parameter here. Uh, all right, let me, um, before I get into that, let me give you your first view quiz answer for today. So uh, first view quiz answer today is the letter B, the letter B as in bear, B as in bear, Bruin bears, um, letter B, first view quiz answer. Okay, the, um, So this is, uh, this is what we're gonna do, okay? So this is our regularized least squares loss function, okay? And we're gonna just kind of say, um, this is what we call the regularization term, right? So here I've written lambda times complexity, but in general, uh, you know, mathematically, we write it as lambda times R of F, okay? And this is a kind of your regularization term. And it's a, it's a function of the <laughs> fitted function, okay? So this is going to output, you, you basically plug in the, the function that you're fitting in, the, the fitted line, and it's going to output some kind of, some kind of term here, OK? Um, all right, and, and just to note, I call this L prime, and this just means it's the modified lo loss function. It is not the derivative of the loss function, OK? Um, sometimes students get confused because you know prime often represents the derivative. This is just to show that it's related to the loss function but is not the loss function itself. Oh, hang on something. Okay, so one way to measure a model's complexity is just how many uh, terms are we fitting, right? How many terms are we fitting or something like that? And so, you know, we can say, you know, model A is a fourth order polynomial and model B is a fifth order polynomial and, um, and if you compare the fourth order and the fifth order polynomial, they're, as far as, you know, how many terms you're fitting, they're pretty much exactly the same, except for the fifth order polynomial, your x to the five term is going to have a w5, okay, uh, basically a sixth um, element in your uh, coefficient vector, whereas the fourth order polynomial, that, that can be constrained to be zero, okay? So one, one possible way to measure, you know, how complex our model is to count is we just count how many non-zero coefficients we have, right? So how many values are not zero, that kind of counts as um, a measure for, um, uh, a measure for complexity, okay? And technically how many non-zero elements you have is known as the, uh, the L0 norm, okay? And, uh, and that works. Okay, but the problem is, is that, you know, computationally optimizing the L0 norm is actually really hard to do, okay? Um, because you have to kind of con consider all possible permutations uh, for which uh, the elements of W are not, uh, are non-zero. Um, and, you know, uh, not only that, but if they are non-zero, what exactly should that value be, right? And so for, you know, any model that has more than just a few terms, this can get um, very complicated very fast. All right, and, um, and so, you know, we don't, we generally don't use this, okay, using the, um, the L1, uh, L0 um, norm, okay? And so one thing we can use instead is the, uh, the absolute value penalty. This is the, uh, the lasso, okay? And so the, uh, the lasso uses the 
the sum of the absolute values of the elements inside your vector w, okay, which would be the L1 norm. And, uh, and that could serve as a measure of complexity, right? And so we're going to say, you know, if, if the coefficient is not zero, it's going to contribute to the penalty factor, uh, penalty factor. And, um, and bigger coefficients will actually contribute even more to the penalty. And, um, and if a coefficient is zero, then, um, then that variable is effectively not counted and is not going to count towards the penalty, fac uh, penalty factor. Okay? And so when you're trying to optimize the loss function, um, anytime uh, any reduction in MSE uh, has to be greater than uh, uh, lambda times the size of whatever coefficient we're using. Okay, and this is known as the lasso. And uh, and then another uh, method we can use is ridge regression. Okay, and in ridge regression, we're going to use the sum of the squared values in W. Okay, we're going to um, sum the uh, squared values of the elements in W. Okay. Larger values are, of W are going to get um, uh, penalized more heavily. Smaller values of W, um, especially uh, values of W that are less than one, are going to be uh, penalized, but um, much less so. Okay, and then obviously values if w, of, of W that are zero are not going to add to the penalty at all. Okay, and this is this is called ridge regression. And uh, and one thing about ridge regression is that it's going to end up preferring values. Where W is, uh, where the elements of W are similar in size to each other, um, just because um, if one of the elements is really big, it's going to contribute a lot towards the uh, the penalty factor. Okay. Now, uh, what people might object to is they say, well, how can um, people go back and say, you know, it makes sense when we talk about how many terms are included in our model. And, and using that as a measure of complexity, you know, if, uh, if you have a bunch of terms that are zero, that means you have a less complex model. And if you have a bunch of terms that are not zero, that means you have a more complicated model. That makes sense to me, okay? But now we're talking about the size of the coefficients themselves. How is that a measure of com complexity, right? And you say, well, you know, I've got one model and, you know, the slope is two and another model, the slope is five, and you're saying the model where the slope is steeper is more complex than the model where the slope is shallow? Is that, is that what you're telling me? And the answer is yes, that's effectively what we're saying. We're saying that the size of the coefficient itself, basically the size of the slope is a measure of complexity, right? And, um, and how, how, is that, how is that the case, right? So, you know, again, the question that students often object to or, or ask is that, you know, why is one model more co complex than another model just because it has a bigger coefficient, okay? Um, if bigger coefficients mean more complexity, you know, can't you just change the unit of measure to shrink the coefficients and reduce the complexity? Um, so instead of measuring it in inches, you can measure it in like uh, meters. And then that's going to kind of shrink your uh, coefficient as well, right? Um, or uh, I mean, sorry, you just you just change it in the opposite direction. Uh, so that doesn't make sense, right? And so so these are valid objections. And so let me try to uh, address this. Okay. Um, so whenever you do um, use lasso, okay, it's almost always recommended that you center and standardize your variables first. Okay. So you're going to um, try to, um, uh, so center means you're going to kind of uh, add or subtract a constant so that the, the values in your x column will have a mean of zero, okay? And then standardizing means multiplying the column so that, um, that the column will have a standard deviation of one, okay? Uh, another alternative for centering and standardizing is just to kind of scale the values so they all go from zero to one, um, and, and that's that's useful if uh, if you have a function like the log function where you can't put in uh, negative values and things like that. Um, so 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 it's often suggested of doing some form of standardization. Okay. 
So standardizing will uh, address the concern that using different units will affect the size of the coefficients, right? So, because if, if you measure someone's height in inches and you, someone else measures their height in, in meters, you know, the coefficients will, will play, uh, will be quite a bit different. Okay, so, but if you standardize them, then your standardized units, you know, different, uh, different units won't affect it, okay? Now, that said, you might not always want to standardize, uh, especially if you're dealing with something like money, okay? Because, um, well, I guess it depends, but um, if, if one variable is kind of like, you know, profits and things like that, um, and, uh, and another thing is, I don't know, something else, if, if you standardize it, you know, then, then you're kind of comparing elements of money that are quite a bit different on different scales and, and you could end up getting something that, that you don't like, okay? Um, but anyway, so how does uh, the size of the coefficient measure complexity, even in this case, even after you've standardized it, okay? All right, so, um, so here's a little bit of a thought experiment that I'm kind of trying to uh, use here, is that let's say there's two competing models that both use the same input matrix X um, they've both been standard, centered and standardized, okay? Um, and, you know, um, we have four X variables, right? And so we're gonna say model one and model two, both, or model A and model B, they both have the same coefficients for X1, X2, and X3, okay? And then for model A, we have a bigger coefficient for X4. Let's say the weight or the coefficient for X4 is one, with model B, we have a tiny coefficient for X4. Let's say the weight uh, for that one is 0 0.01. So it's not zero, but it's, uh, it's a lot smaller, 0 0.01, okay? So with the exception of the coefficient for your X4 term, model A and model B are the same, okay? And if this is the case, I would argue that model B is less complex than model A simply because it has a smaller coefficient for X4, okay? Um, and the argument here is that when you have a tiny coefficient uh, applied to that variable X4, it means changes in that predictor variable X4 has little impact on the outcome variable, okay? Your prediction is affected uh, minimally by changes to that uh, variable X4, okay? Um, so. If it has a tiny coefficient on X4, it's placing a lot less importance to the variable X4, okay? And, uh, and if, it, if that coefficient is 0.01, you know, it's very close to being zero. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's not entirely that different from a model where you just have zero for the coefficient for X4. And we all agreed that, you know, if you have zero for that coefficient, then it's less complex, right? It's, um, it doesn't, it's not influencing the, the outcome at all. So even though model A and model B both use that variable X4 and model B um, uh, doesn't have a zero coefficient, it is pretty close to just ignoring X4 altogether, right? And because it's close to ignoring X4 altogether, it's the simpler model, right? Okay, and so uh, I have this analogy and yeah, I know you guys have not been on campus, right? But let's, let's imagine we have two students and both students are involved in several clubs on campus, okay? And uh, one of the student is fully invested in all of their clubs, right? They have a busy schedule. They live, we might say they live a complicated life, right? They, they attend all of these meetings, they, they're in leadership, they have to do all kinds of stuff, right? The other student perhaps might also be quote unquote involved in the same number of clubs, maybe even in all of the same clubs as the, the other student, maybe both of them are in the same exact clubs, but the second student is, you know, only marginally invested in the clubs, okay? You know, they skip meetings whenever they feel like it, you know, they don't really volunteer to, you know, bring stuff or do stuff um, that much, okay? So as far as, you know, how many clubs are they involved in, both of them have the uh, same number, Okay, same number of elements, but we would say that the student who is kind of less committed and, you know, not doing all of these, <laughs> not as committed to the clubs, we would probably say that this student's life is a little bit simpler, less complicated, right? You have less obligations, you can just relax whenever, that student can relax whenever, right? And so how much 
weight we place on each of these kind of predictor variables, you know, as after it's been standardized, can be used as a measure for how complicated the model is. Okay, so um, so that's kind of the the premise behind both lasso and ridge regression is that um, we're putting we're taking how big our coefficients are, and we're saying you know that's going to be a kind of a, a measure of how complicated the models are, right? Okay, so um, just for a simple example, um, I'm going to just generate some simple two-dimensional data. Okay, x1 and x2 they're both on the same scale, so I'm not going to bother centering and scaling them. Okay, and so x1 I've got the values one through four, and x2 I got the values one through four, and the true model the, the true values of t are going to be 1.5 times x1 plus 0.5 times x2, OK? There's no intercept here. I'm going to just add some noise to t, all right? So I'm just going to take some uh, random standard normal noise, OK? And we're going to fit a model. We're going to say fit the model, predict, um, predict t based on x1 and x2. And so according to uh, ordinary least squares regression, the best fitting coefficients are going to be 1.45 for x1 and 0 0.45 for x2, okay, or 1.46, all right, uh, which is close to the true values, which were 1.5 and 0.5, okay, and so we, we get something close to that, uh, not exactly so because we added random noise. All right, and so if I wanted to do this um, using, um, using Optim, okay, so uh, in your homework assignment, how do you guys use Optim, right? And, um, and I think you, you saw that. So, so here um, I'm running Optim. And basically, I just have a, a way to kind of calculate the ordinary OLS loss, OK? And we're going to say, you know what? I'm going to plug in uh, OLS loss into the uh, Optim function, OK? And we say, you know, find the values of, um, of W. OK, we're going to put that, you know, in. The, the par portion, we're going to say, you know, find the parameters that will minimize this OLS loss, okay? And so using Optim, I get the exact same values that I got using um, LM. Okay, so using LM, I got these values, okay, maybe not exactly the same, but, but pretty close, okay, uh, using Optim. All right, and, and the reason why I'm using Optim is because I'm not going to use LM anymore, is what we're trying to do is we're going to say, you know what, find the function that's going to minimize our loss function, but we're going to modify this loss function. So the loss function will not just be the sum of squared residuals, you know, um, t minus xw transpose times t minus xw. It's not going to be just the sum of squared uh, residuals, but it's going to be the sum of squared residuals plus that com complexity parameter, okay? But anyway, um, we could plot the contours of the loss function, right? And so the contours of the loss function is this kind of two-dimensional uh, ellipsoid uh, bowl thing. And we can see that the minimum occurs, you know, right around uh, you know, 1.5 and 0.5, I think, you know, 1.44, 1.46 and 0.45, okay? This is where the minimum of the OLS loss happens, right? So the, um, the, the mean squared errors are, are smallest here, okay. Let me give you your second quiz answer. Second view quiz answer is C, C as in cat. The second view quiz answer is C as in cat. All right. Okay. So what we're going to do here is we're going to modify the loss function. Okay, we're going to include the ordinary least squares loss. Okay, so as far as the function that we're going to try to minimize, the L1 loss, we're going to include the ordinary least squares loss, but we're also going to add lambda times the sum of the absolute values of, of W1 and W2. Okay, so this is the L1 norm. We're going to take whatever elements W1 and W2 are, we're going to take the absolute values and, and sum them up. Okay. And in order to use it with Optim, I have to kind of, I, I modified my function so that it uses par rather than, um, than w1 and w2. And so, you know, we're going to take par1 and par2 and stuff like that. Okay. All right. And so, you know, if we only cared, so 
this is what the contours look like um, with uh, just the OLS function. But with just the OLS function, this is what it looks like. If we only cared about the L1 norm, this is kind of the, the shape that it would look like. Okay, the, the contours of the loss function would basically be these diamonds centered at the origin because uh, we want to shrink basically the, the absolute values of W1 and W2. And, and basically W1 and W2 have kind of um, the, the you'll, you'll get this, um, these diamond shapes because here, let's say W1 is one and W2 is zero at this point, um, kind of the, the, the same value happens at when W2 is one and W1 is zero or W1 and W2 are both 0.5 and 0.5. And so you, you basically have a negative slope here and a slope of positive one over here and things like that, okay? But this is, we don't care only about the L1 norm. We care about kind of minimizing the combination of the ordinary least squares plus the L1 norm. And so the resulting loss function is gonna be kind of a hybrid between the two extremes. One being, one extreme is the diamonds, and the other is these ovals, okay? And so our, um, the, the resulting loss function when, when we combine the two is gonna be kind of a, a hybrid between the, the two things, okay? And so, um, so let me just show you the, the results of the coefficients when I choose different lambda values, okay? So lambda is how much weight we put on the complexity uh, penalty. Right? So if we have no uh, lambda, okay, then our um, then we just have the OLS coefficients, which are around 1.46 and 0.45. As soon as I introduce uh, an element lambda here, these values shrink a little bit. Okay, so this is also why it's called a shrinkage method, is because the coefficients end up shrinking; they end up getting a little bit smaller. Okay, so instead of 1.46. Five, eight, we have 1.436. Instead of 0.453, we have 0.43, okay? As I increase lambda, what happens is these numbers will get a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller. My uh, L1 term gets smaller. My L2 term, or my X2 term coefficient also gets uh, a little bit smaller, okay? And, um, and as my lambda gets bigger and bigger and bigger, these numbers continue to get smaller and smaller, okay? Uh, at lambda equal to 300, the coefficient for x2 is um, almost zero. And at lambda equal to five, um, and my coefficient for x1 is not zero, but you know around 0.6. And at lambda equal to 500, both of these things are pretty much zero, are equal to zero. Okay. Let me just show you kind of the, the plot, okay? This is a plot of the contour lines. I have... Um, the y and the x-axis drawn here, okay? And as I increase my lambda, you'll notice that the contour, uh, this is the contours of the loss function will change shape, okay? So um, back here, this is the contours of the OLS loss function. We're trying to find the coefficient of x1 and x2 that minimize the um, sum of squared residuals, okay? And we get these ellipsoids and they're ellipsoids because we're basically dealing with a squared function, quadratic function here. Uh, and now my con uh, loss function is a combination of that OLS plus um, the absolute values, the L1 norm, okay? And so as I increase lambda, look at, look at what happens to my loss function contours. I get kind of these, I get like this weird thing happening at the axis, okay? Um, and so with lambda equal to 100, I get these, uh, my contour lines have this weird shape, okay? And what's happening is that if you think about the absolute values, when you come about the absolute value, when you have positive values, as you approach the absolute, the absolute value function keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller until it reaches zero. And when it reaches zero, it forms a very sharp angle and starts going up in the other direction. And that's basically what we're seeing is that when we're adding the OLS, which is the ovals, and we're basically adding the, uh, the diamonds, okay, we're getting kind of this weird hybrid between diamonds and ovals that, uh, that end up taking shape here, okay? This blue dot represents 
the kind of the optimum value for the coefficient for uh, W1 and W2 that minimize the loss function, okay? And so this red dot represents kind of the original OLS loss. And we can see that as I increase lambda, this blue dot travels towards the, uh, the y-axis, okay? Or uh, yeah, towards uh, this axis in kind of this diagonal manner. And then it basically intersects this. And then once it hits this, it's not going to keep traveling down in this diagonal manner. It's, it's basically minimized the amount that W2 can contribute. Basically, the coefficient for W2 at this point is 0. And so we can't shrink the W2 coefficient anymore. Uh, W2 will no, is no longer contributing anything to the penalty factor. And so the only thing that's left to do is shrink W1. Okay, So if I continue saying, you know, anytime you have a coefficient, we're penalizing that complexity. What we're going to do is we're going to shrink the coefficient of w1 further. All right, so you have kind of this path where we start off um, when lambda is small, um, you know, we're shrinking our values a tiny bit, okay, but they're pretty much very similar to the OLS um, values, okay, but we're saying, you know, your coefficients, we're penalizing them because basically they're too big, right? Anytime you have values, <laughs> any, any value that's not zero contributes to the penalty. And so if we say, well, I don't want this penalty, I want to keep shrinking it, right? Um, basically, the W1 and W2 get shrunk um, together. And so that's why it's traveling in a diagonal line, because W1 and W2 are basically penalized equally. And until uh, W2 becomes zero. And at that point, w, um, W2 cannot shrink anymore. And so we just shrink W1 and it basically runs until um, it hits the origin. And basically at this point, um, W1 and W2 are both zero and we're just predicting zero for all of our values, okay? Yeah. Which, which is not a good model. But, um, but this is what happens when you say, I'm gonna penalize um, any measure of complexity, uh, any coefficient, um, very heavily. And at that point, um, you have this. Okay, and, and this kind of looks like the diamonds, but again, it's a, it's a strange hybrid between the diamonds and the, um, the ellipses. Is that okay? Does that kind of make sense, uh, what's happening there? Okay, so... Um, so as lambda increases, we see the parameter values travel diagonally until it hits the kind of the x-axis and then it gets pulled towards zero, okay? Uh, with ridge regression, our complexity penalty is the uh, sum of the um, squares of your um, W coefficients, all right? So if you take W and you square them, um, we we square those and, uh, and we apply that as the complexity. We're still taking our ordinary least squares loss, the ellipses, but now we're adding this, okay? And I, I don't have a picture here, but actually I do on Wikipedia. Let me see if I can find it. So on Wikipedia, this is basically the, uh, the L1 norm has these diamond-shaped penalties, and then the L2, when you add basically squared terms, you're basically getting a circle or a, a sphere or some you know, n-dimensional sphere. And so basically, the, the penalty over here is going to be circles, okay? And so you can think of, you know, when I plot out the contours, you're going to have basically this hybrid between ellipses and circles, and you're going to see the, um, the, uh, the shape um, when, when we add you know, we're basically, the OLS part is ellipses, this part is ellipse, and, uh, and this part is going to be circles, and depending on um, which, uh, how heavy we put lambda, is going to shift between being mostly ellipses to mostly circles, okay? And, um, but if you take a look at the coefficients themselves, okay, again, when you have lambda equal to zero or, or no, uh, no lambda term, then, um, then the, uh, the values are the OLS terms. And as you uh, increase lambda, the values will shrink, okay? But there's something interesting that happens. Here, 
These shrink from 1.45 to 1.25, but the X2 term actually increases from 0.45 to 0.579. So it's actually not shrinking, it's actually growing for the X2 or the W2 term, okay? Uh, at lambda 50, this has shrunk from 1.25 to 0.92, and this has further grown to 0.579 to 0.635, okay? At lambda 100, this shrinks from 0.92 to 0.74, and this starts coming back down from 0.635 to 0.573, okay? And we can keep seeing, you know, as lambda gets bigger and bigger, these values get smaller and smaller, but um, they don't quite reach zero, okay? So even at lambda 500, we're, we're not close to zero, okay? So here, uh, we start off here, and I, and I draw this line, a diagonal line uh, for uh, W1 equal to W2, and what we're going to see is that as I increase lambda, again, the red dot represents the OLS estimates, and the W will be the regularized estimates, is that as I increase lambda, um, the W1 term will shrink from over here uh, and, whoops, and approach um, you know, close to zero, whereas the W2 term starts off around 0.5, but actually goes up and then starts to go down, okay? So there's kind of this, this interesting thing where we start off here, as I increase lambda, they go up, they kind of approach this line, y equals x, and once it gets close to y equals x, then it just, they get drawn closer and closer to zero, okay? So there's kind of this, it, there's a path that it forms where it's going towards the line y equals x and then starts climbing towards the origin, okay? And you can also take a look at the contour lines. In the beginning, they're very much ellipses. And as I increase the lambda, they start shifting away from the ellipses and start heading more towards circles, okay? And so, yeah, what we see is that the values travel towards the line W1 equal to W2, and then they get kind of pulled, pulled towards zero, okay? And so the reason why we see that is because the way uh, ridge regression works is it's doing the squared um, squared coefficient uh, is penalized. And so um, a large value, like if your W1 is 10, its penalty is 100, okay? Whereas if your W2 is one, its penalty is one, okay? And so if you have to shrink something, you're gonna get a lot more value out of shrinking um, uh, say 10 down to nine, okay? Shrinking from 10 down to nine will go from a penalty of 100 down to 81, which is a reduction of basically uh, 19 points, 100 to 81. Whereas shrinking from one to zero will only net you, you know, uh, a savings of one from one squared to zero squared will go from one to zero. So well, I guess I, I have that something similar here. 11 to 10 reduces from 121 to 100. 3 to 2 reduces the penalty from 9 to 4. So you see what happens is it shrinks the bigger ones first, and then, it, and then it'll worry about shrinking the other one, okay? And what we're, we're actually seeing over here is that it's kind of compensating for the shrinking of W1 by actually increasing W2, because apparently when you shrink W1, you can kind of make up for the um, shrinking W1 is going to affect the OLS estimates, uh, OLS loss a bit, and you can actually kind of get some improvement by increasing your W2 a bit. Okay. Um, and so regularization has the effect of kind of reducing the overall variance of parameter estimates. Okay. And so, um, I've written a lot of stuff here, and I'm going to show you these plots here, okay? This, this cloud of points represents a bunch of different W1 and W2 estimates for the same original model. So remember the original model, the true value was the true coefficient for x1 is 1.5, and the true coefficient for x2 was 0.5. That was the true original model. The, the coefficient for in the population, the coefficient for x1 is 1.5, and the coefficient for x2 is 0.5. But we're estimating our model um, not on the population, but on a sample of data. And in my sample of data, I've added noise, right? So I've added random noise 
I think in my code, you know, here's um, the true value here is, you know, I've got the coefficient 1.5 times x1 and 0.5 times x2, but, um, but we're adding some random noise here, okay? The, the values, I've got my true values z and I'm adding some random noise. And so every time I add random noise, that's gonna affect what kind of coefficient estimates I get, right? So depending on your random noise, maybe we overestimate the size of W1, maybe we underestimate the size of W2 or things like that. These are all subject to randomness. And so I did this like a thousand different times with a thousand different random data sets of, of, of 16 data points with a different amounts of noise. And these are kind of the estimates of W1 and W2 that I get, okay? This is the cloud of points. So sometimes it overestimated W1 by saying, you know, the coefficient for W1 is really big and the coefficient for W2 is small. Sometimes uh, we got W1 too small and W2 too big. Overall, we're pretty close to the center of around 1.5.5, but you know, there's definitely variation there. So the way um, regularization works is that as I increase lambda, what you'll notice is that, so <laughs> using the same, um, the same data sets, uh, I say, what are the lasso estimates, okay? So the lasso estimates are in red and the OLS estimates are in black. And what, what's actually happening is that the red cl cloud of points is the exact same as the black cloud of points, but just shifted a little bit diagonally, okay? If I increase lambda further, we get basically the same thing. This orange cloud of points is the exact same as this black cloud of points, it's just shifted more diagonally. But what's happening is that when that cloud of points crashes into the, um, the x-axis is that it basically dies, okay? When, when it hits the x-axis, um, the W2 coefficient has become zero and we can't shrink it any further. Uh, we're not gonna gain anything by having W2 become negative. And so basically all the W2 values just, you know, um, become zero here, okay? So we're kind of um, shifting the cloud diagonally, but as it hits the axis, it just kind of dies, right? And so if I increase lambda to be this huge number like 250, we're taking that same cloud of points, but we've shifted it so far diagonally that all of these points have just become zero, okay? And so there's like this massive, I don't know, almost like a graveyard of W2 coefficients that have all become zero. And, and we can keep increasing lambda. And at this point, I've, I've shifted it so far that everything has become zero and, uh, and all the coefficients are now, there's one dot of blue right here at zero, zero, okay? Um, and so kind of plotted all together, you can see, uh, you can see the cloud, the black, red, orange, and green cloud, they're exactly the same. They all have the same kind of weird uh, outliers. And, and that's because they're all just shifting diagonally. Okay. Whereas when you do um, ridge regression, ridge regression actually tries to shrink the parameters so that they're closer to e each other. Okay. Again, because it's, it's, uh, it doesn't want these parameters to be of different size. They want, it prefers them to kind of be of similar size. It doesn't like any one value being much greater than the other, all right? And so uh, with lambda equal to 10, the, the variance, we can see the variation in the red, red cloud is a lot smaller than the variation in the black cloud, okay? With lambda equal to 100, this is already kind of extreme. The variation in coefficient estimates is quite small. It's, it's, it's we can see, there's a lot less variation there. They're in this much tighter cloud of points. And, um, and if I just kind of continue this with uh, lambda even greater for uh, at 250 lambda equal to 500, we can see the amount of variation in these W1 and W2 estimates get uh, shrink even further, okay? And so there's a, a lot less variance in kind of these, uh, in these estimates when, when you apply this shrinkage factor. Now I would say, you know, using a lambda like 250 or 500 is, is gonna result in a poor performing model just because um, you know, you're kind of almost ignoring a lot of what the OLS loss is saying. Um, but these are just kind of taken to an extreme just kind of for illustrative examples of, of, of teaching and education. So you can kind of see 
you know, what's this, what are, what are the principles of regularization and what would happen if we kind of take it to the extreme to kind of its, uh, its end there. Uh, okay, and so I, I've just kind of described, put, put those into words here and, uh, and I hope that makes a little bit of sense there. All right, let me give you your last view quiz answer for today. Last view quiz answer is E, E as an elephant. E as an elephant is our last view quiz answer. And, uh, and we will end here. All right, um, have a good weekend, you guys. And we will see you guys on Monday.